Do elites and secret societies run the world? Is love ultimately a selfish act? Why do we still have wars and other irrational beliefs while we still know how unique and precious we are in the universe? On Seekers Mind Talks, today we have polymath Robin Hansen returning on our podcast. He is the professor of economics at George Mason University and has written two bestsellers, The Age of M and The Elephant in Our Brains. He is also the pioneer of mind-boggling ideas from the great filter which describes why we haven't seen aliens yet to futarchy which is a form of government which he proposes is an alternative to democracy he is arguably one of the prominent polymath minds out there and i had a fantastic time talking with robin as usual i'm your host raj and enjoy the conversation with robin on the seekers mind talks In the past uh, half a century, uh, we've expanded our knowledge and information on a cosmic level. Our knowledge and database on the vastness of our universe has far exceeded our expectations. And we are expanding every day as we speak. We now have the knowledge that we are insignificant at the same time precious uh even though we have this amount of cosmic awareness why do you think we as a species still fight over you know wars and uh, religious issues and we need to unite on a species level right with this amount of cosmic awareness so you're talking about coordination mhm um you know most life on earth doesn't coordinate very much but multicellular animals are when big piles of cells coordinate relative to single cell animals and then social animals are those where groups of animals coordinate relative to individual animals and then humans have pioneered much larger scale coordination a uh, whole first whole town village areas maybe a thousand or so humans could coordinate then um even larger groups were able to coordinate through trade and war uh and so compared to the rest of the planet and the rest of the universe we are champions of coordination we are pushing the frontier forward of managing larger scale coordination but coordination is hard <laughs> and there's many ways we're just not up to the task of coordinating at the species level mm-hmm. um and so we could talk about what are the you know obstacles to coordination but uh i think it's not clear we can coordinate that much more than we are um certainly you know we talked about last time um one of our main mechanisms for learning so much that we you know as you mentioned that we've been learning so much in the last century about ourselves and the universe one of the main mechanisms for doing that is culture and the mechanisms that have created this cultural powerhouse that lets us learn all these things has in substantial part been competition mm. and so coordinating at the scale of the species threatens to undermine competition within the species so it's especially difficult to figure out how to coordinate at the species level without turning off the engine of competition that's given us these superpowers that's enabled us to learn so much i mean uh, competition is absolutely necessary uh, it has its benefits but i think we take it too personally right because uh, when i say i i i am a canadian or i'm an indian or, or i be i am a us citizen i take that personally and, and i think that kind of undermines this coordination at a species level do you feel that way it, it the co- the competition has its benefits definitely 100% and we need those divisions we need categories in our head to coordinate and to establish that competition to so that we we strive for more but but that's a blockage to this species level awareness uh i mean i think we're all 
pretty aware that the human species exists. Mm -hmm. So awareness of the species is not really a problem in our world, and it hasn't been for a pretty long time. But the we're we're pretty aware that humans are a distinct species on the planet, and we're aware roughly where humans are distributed on the planet, roughly how many are where and what their rough status is. At the moment, that's pretty widespread knowledge. The world just knows who is where roughly. So so we know species exist. We have species awareness. The question is how often and how are we inclined to coordinate as a species, to do things together as a species, to promote the species? Um, of course, we could coordinate on an even larger scale to promote all of life, not just species. And right. we, of course, find that even harder to coordinate uh, with all of life. And of course, we could try to coordinate with our future selves and our past selves, uh, but we find that also hard to do. So, I mean, the key thing is coordination is just hard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you look at even on smaller scales on, on a family or a neighborhood or a company, you can start to see just all the obstacles of coordination. <laughs> they, they just stand out in your face and they're difficult. It's difficult to coordinate even small organizations and the larger the groups you're trying to coordinate, the harder it gets. I know what I was thinking is, is there a root cause for it? And what, that is what I was trying to figure out. Certainly. Well, I mean, in general, failure has many causes. <laughs> that is, when there's something that's hard to do, there's just mm -hmm. a lot of ways to go wrong uh, and a few ways to go right. So, you know, it's better to understand what are the key trade-offs and obstacles to going right. But if you fail to go right, there's just lots of different directions you can go wrong. So it's not, it's not mm -hmm. hard to understand why there are so many ways we fail. Okay. Uh, what keeps me up at night is that we are damn precious and we are that rare of a species, at least in the observable universe. And it doesn't make sense to fight, even though it has its political, economical, and whatever baggage benefits that comes along the way, doesn't still outweigh that single point, right? I'm actually not sure. Really? So if you think about ourselves as just sort of deal makers, mm -hmm. you know, you each want to eat food and you want to live comfortably, uh, and you have a set of resources and a technology for doing things, that's sort of a standard economic framework. Then in that framework, uh, you would want to coordinate with the world to, you know, trade with them, to give them stuff that it's easy for you to make and get stuff from them that's easy for them to make and to specialize so we each do the thing we're best at and to have law and justice so that we can discourage bad behavior and then to have peace so that we don't go to war. Those are all things that make sense from the point of view of just thinking of yourself as someone who has some resources, some stuff you want, and there's a big world out there. And we could go wrong by fighting each other or by failing to, you know, arrange things well. Mm. But this whole picture I just described to you has the problem that um, it's just assuming that we exist and have these resources and these technologies for doing things. But if you step back and say, well, where did those come from? <laughs> How do those get made and, and improved? Well, fighting is a lot of how that worked. Uh we, we wouldn't be here with these resources and capabilities to do things had there not been a lot of competition and fighting in the past that drove selection of cultures and practices that were better than others. Mm -hmm. So if you try to turn that all off and say, let's just not have any more competition or fighting now, isn't that like in the way? Well, then not only might we not improve in the future, we might decay. That is, the structures we have aren't self-perpetuating. <laughs> They tend to be structures that naturally decay unless they are continually improved, you know, mm -hmm. corrected uh, the ways they go wrong. So, yes, it might be that, uh, in fact, competition and fighting is essential to where we, how we got to where we are and how we might do better in the future. Mm. I, I was digging into that point and um, uh, it basically ran to uh, how we are still monkeys at heart. Because of the, our closest relatives, when we look into the DNA, are bonobos and chimpanzees. And out of all other monkeys, only bonobos and chimpanzees, they kind of divide their land and they form their own territory and gangs and attack each other and have this sort of uh, ladder-like 
societal structure where they are they are governed by one single individual or two or three individuals and it seems like we have not drifted far down that line we are still monkeys at heart well as you should expect <laughs> you know we're only what a million years different mm-hmm. from them a million mm-hmm. years is a pretty short time in the history of life on earth as you as you recall it's been around 4 billion years <laughs> so 40 times longer than a million years um but of course you know the still the question is well, where did you want to go and how do you think we could get there and and are you really actually considering all the relevant constraints when mm-hmm. you have these visions of of where you think we want to go i i think a lot of people just are neglecting key processes that made us who we are and that are main, have maintained at least in the past who we were and we can't just throw those key processes away and expect things to continue to work well and definitely mhm a subtle point what what i wanted to add is not to take competition away but there should be a bar somewhere where it doesn't cross that line you know that's not worth it so what sort of line would that be maybe no wars for any reason like cut the funding or you know no civil wars either probably yeah we can think right well then is it worth well, it well then the point is if there's a government the people don't like it are they just supposed to suffer under it or can they get rid of it need a form of government that would allow it to be overthrown through some nonviolent means mm-hmm. if you want to hope for no civil war but then you might even still say well who's going to be in charge of preventing war <laughs> who do we task with that assignment to uh stop war and what could they do with that power how far badly might they misuse it and why why is that violence our second option well it you know violence is just something we're physically capable of doing in the universe but mm-hmm. if you want to take that physical capability away you have to do it through some physical means so mm-hmm. we have to coordinate to create some structure that prevents the violence and that structure is in control of violence and therefore capable of being violent so in some sense we have to you know standard story is that government is some monopoly on violence there's there's a danger in empowering a monopoly of violence and what question is what what checks do we have on that what what can we do if it goes wrong how do you tackle nihilism what would you, what would you call nihilism i guess what how would you define it in the in a cosmic perspective uh at least when you consider thermodynamics everything's supposed to the universe is supposed to go to a heat death and so in the end nothing we do we can say if, at least with our current knowledge that nothing we do really matters in the end so why take anything seriously and why do the things we actually do you're asking where we get our values where mm-hmm. we get our preferences um so if you thought that um because the universe will eventually end nothing matters that's an attitude you have and an assumption you have about values that isn't implied by the universe it's a it's a choice of some sort that was made on your behalf at least and if that's dysfunctional i e if it makes you not motivated to do stuff then you and your descendants will lose compared to other creatures who are more motivated in that situation or who deny that situation if necessary so the more fundamental fact is motivation is something that is given to us by natural selection mhm all animals are motivated to do what they do and the i mean they may not know that the universe will eventually end but it's not clear that it would matter much to them if they did it's just hardly something they can conceive or conceive of caring about really <laughs> they have just have much more immediate concerns and those are the things that animate them and properly so i suppose um but you as a human are a different sort of creature than other animals and you have a different set of motivations and sort of attitudes toward motivation and those were created by cultural selection that's where you got them and different of us can have different of these motivations and attitudes and the process of cultural selection isn't very precise or reliable so it's just going to randomly produce some people who aren't very motivated mm-hmm. but then 
they get selected out and problem solved. So at the highest level, the point is if you find yourself having, you know, lacking motivation such that it looks like you would be maladaptive, i.e. you wouldn't do the sort of actions that would perpetuate yourself or get yourself to do stuff, you know, there's this generic solution is that you will just be selected out <laughs> and others will replace you who have motivations more compatible with either the fact of the universe ending or the fact that they could forget about that and ignore it and deny it themselves. I mean, those are all obvious options that other creatures could have. <laughs> um, so you just, maybe you should ask yourself, how is it that you happen to have this belief that um, the universe ending somehow means that you shouldn't be motivated to care about stuff around you? Because that, that sounds kind of strange if you think about it abstractly, right? If we think about evolution, what sort of motivations should it give creatures? It should give creatures motivations to like succeed in their local competitions in the immediate world around them. It's not clear why they should care much about the distant end of the universe. It doesn't affect their behavior very much. So why should their motivations depend on it much at all? How some people deal with this is because they they know for a fact that thermodynamically or whatever, the universe might go to a heat death. And you can see this in an optimistic manner. And so you have a freedom to operate in a much more wider bracket and um, sort of play more around the world and sort of bring out maybe new cultural tendencies. So, but it also doesn't undermine the fact that the universe is going to, is there an, another alternative to this where the universe will not go to a heat death? Uh, yes, actually. Okay. So, you know, there are, you know, understandable points of view about physics in the universe such that the heat death won't be an ultimate problem. Mm -hmm. um, basically, uh, it, there might not be a finite upper bound to the amount of entropy in the universe in front of us. Mm -hmm. So in a finite system, uh, there is a finite amount of entropy that's possible. And if entropy increases consistently, which is what the second law of thermodynamics says, then there's a point at which it can, can't go any higher. So the heat death of the universe is as it approaches maximum entropy, that you just can't run engines on the difference anymore and you can't do stuff anymore. But that's all based on there being a finite maximum amount of entropy for the mass, you know, the matter and space time around us mm -hmm. uh, as it goes into the future. Mm -hmm. But it's quite plausible that there's no upper bound, <laughs> that we can keep spinning off baby universes and other sorts of things that just keep expanding the amount of entropy possible, mm -hmm. in which case the difference between the actual entropy at any one place in time and the potential near there is still a lot because there is no upper bound. So that's physically possible. Uh, as far as I don't know, if we know which one is true, but it's possible that there is no heat death of the universe, uh, you know, ending constraint, but it's also possible that there is. You could well find yourself in a part of the universe where it wasn't practically possible or useful to make baby universes. So with the part of the universe you're going to be in, there's going to be a heat death. That That's also a coherent possibility. Uh, the reason why I brought that up is I think especially in America and uh, all the Western countries where there's like a lack of a central culture and they lean to these sort of philosophies and people sort of get lost in these sort of meaninglessness and it's very hard to climb yourself out from that and I wanted to see how how you, you tackle these sort of thoughts. Well, I, to me, you know, the, the larger trends are that People had things that gave them strong meaning in the past. Mm -hmm. They had family, they had religion, they had nationalism, you know, they had strong associations of ideologies. And these gave them meaning and motivation to do many things. And then for some reasons, people's attachments, these things have become weaker. They feel less compelling attachment to religion or family or nation or ideology, and then they lack in their mind an alternative that compels them as strongly. So that's a fact about 
cultural evolution in our last century, say. It's not really a fact about the world outside of our recent history. Most of the world before then felt plenty motivated. Uh, although we have seen times and places in the past where analogous th things happened, those times were apparently when rich elites felt very secure and had, you know, comfortable worlds of what they call decadence. And then they apparently reported failures to feel very motivated or organized to do things. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if, if this is happening and it's a problem, then I attribute this to a cultural drift. <laughs> I say, well, yes, apparently there is a possibly tendency for people to lose their motivation, to lose attachment to things that drive them. But in a health, healthy world of cultural evolution, those problems wouldn't last very long because whatever subgroups indulged those inclinations wouldn't last very long. Mm -hmm. But in our world, we have such weak cultural selection and low cultural variety that these things can last and have accumulating impact. Part of the reason is because of the information age and the internet spreading information at a faster rate and everybody is becoming more and more aware of things. And uh, as well, you know, well, most why would those not... things be demotivating? <laughs> why would learning so many things about the universe and the world be demotivating? That That's more of a puzzle. It's no particular reason why all these things we're learning should make us not want to get up in the morning. Certainly 100% life is precious. Uh, it It needs... It has its significance, 100% sure. But what I was trying to address that problem of this nihilism and people having a hard time climbing out of it. Right, but that's in some sense, look, most people through history were poor and near the edge of survival, mm -hmm. right? So when poor people near the edge of survival, uh, mostly they just get on and try to survive and it's pretty motivating. But some of them sometimes go, well, what's the point? I quit, this is, this is just too much trouble. And then, it's easy to predict what happens to them. <laughs> they quickly go away, right? And the, that's how the world solves that problem. Uh, <laughs> when Peter near the edge of survival tried to quit, quit trying to survive, well, they don't survive. Um, uh, but here, when we're rich, you see, and comfortable, healthy, and at world at peace, then these sorts of inclinations can last for a while and even accumulate mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there isn't the selection force to push them aside. Uh, is there a decline in the trust for institutions in the current decade? I believe there are over the last you know half century or century substantial mm -hmm. reported declines in trust in many kinds of authorities, including authoritative institutions, including, say, the, the military, Congress, academia, bosses, you know, etc. Why, why is that happening? Why do people suddenly lose trust in institutions? Um, I don't know. <laughs> that, that is, um, it could be that, you know, you're depending more on sort of ignorance in the past. You trusted them because you didn't know very much and maybe you idealize them. And now that you've learned more de details that don't match your ideals, you are discouraged and don't mm -hmm. trust them. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe that it just, there's an equilibrium where you sound more sophisticated or independent or higher status if you seem distrusting. So maybe the trusting people seem stupid and uh, submissive. And you can, by showing your skepticism and cynicism, uh, show how clever and wise mm -hmm. and aware and, and uh, independent you are. Point I wanted to bring up is because for a democracy to work, the citizens need to be aware. And it seems to that when the citizens are getting more aware, as you said, <laughs> the the whole institution is going down. Well, I mean, you know, I, I distinguish between trust and trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, you know, it's good if trust matches trustworthiness. Uh, it's It's not so good if people trust something that isn't actually trustworthy. And so then I might wonder, well, has trustworthiness changed? Are okay. people trusting too much in the past? And now they're trusting the right amount compared to trustworthiness, or has trustworthiness gone down? Hmm. If trustworthiness has gone down, that seems like a clearer problem. Uh, 
but even then, I think we can understand that uh, once upon a time, the reason why many institutions were trustworthy was that many members of institutions felt strong attachments and loyalty to those institutions and, you know, acted to achieve the ideals of those institutions, say, even at personal sacrifice, say, a member of the military or a, a teacher or a doctor, right? If they hold those institutions as high ideals and then hold their personal behavior to those ideal standards in order to realize that ideal, in, at least in their practice, then those institutions would be more trustworthy. But if individuals are not willing to feel as attached and loyal to such institutions in order to achieve their ideals, then they won't act so much to achieve the ideals of those institutions. And then they, in fact, won't achieve them and they will be less trustworthy, right? So part of this would be the fact that once upon a time, if you were a doctor or a train engineer or whatever, that it was a big part of your identity and you were willing to submit your own personal inclinations and rewards to this identity that you had accepted and were going to achieve the ideals of, mm. right? But today we feel less attached and loyal to such things. We are more independent. We more care about ourselves and our personal, you know, leisure lives and our, um, opportunities and our identity and our, you know, our, our other identities and our independence. Mm -hmm. And by prioritizing those, we less prioritize these roles mm -hmm. that we have played within institutions. And then we less sacrifice to achieve the ideals of those roles. I also see that this hustle culture and the solopreneur type of mentality is on the rise. And I even read somewhere uh, Sam Altman saying uh, they have a bet at Silicon Valley saying that the next next billion dollar business is going to be a solo solopreneur business. It's, it's I see a single person business and no, with yes. no employees. Yes. <laughs> that seems hard. Yeah. But that trend seems to be on the rise and it seems to be aligning with what you said. People are less willing to submit their own personal identity to a larger organization that hmm. they feel mm -hmm. allied with and committed to. As culture is getting, uh, no, as the economy is getting more comfortable, do we think we are going in that direction of detaching from a community and going it, solo? I mean, it just does seem like people are less willing to, you know, suppress their personal ambitions and um, other life goals to a career identity, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, at, at least in, in many ways. Although I guess I should back off on that. I mean, one of the key drivers of, say, lower fertility is people spending longer times on career paths to try to achieve career success. And there's a higher priority on that compared to a century ago. And you know, with more gender equality, it includes both men and women uh, trying to achieve career success. Um, so, okay, let's switch gears. And uh, uh, how is elitism evolving in the current world? How much are they in control of a population or calling the shots? Um, there are times when supposedly populist movements happen <laughs> where people are criticizing at least some kinds of elites and opposing them or resisting them. But that's almost always some other set of elites who are, you know, fighting a, a previous set of elites or a different set of elites. And it's really an between elite conflict. So uh, almost all societies at almost all times are dominated by elites. <laughs> that's just the nature of human society all the way back. Um, if you see people saying they are anti-elite, what they are anti is a certain kind of elite that's been highlighted to them by some other elites who mm -hmm. are, they are following to, um, dis uh, the elites they don't like in favor of the elites they do. And there's, you know, different kinds of elites. So there are, they are all sort of conflicts and they would, different classes of elites would all like to raise the status of their class of elites and take down the others. So, you know, for example, 
intellectual elites might like to take down wealth elites and say, well, the rich shouldn't have so much money. You should listen to more to us intellectuals about how to run society. And religious elites might want to disapprove of, you know, um, pleasure elites <laughs> and say those pleasure elites are misleading you down the bad pleasure path and you should resist those elites and accept the religious elites directions for your lives, right? These are all ways in which different kinds of elites are fighting each other and taking each other down. Mm -hmm. um, you certainly, I think you see, say, even in say cancel culture, you know, when one group of the political spectrum, you know, they're looking for elites on the other side to take down. They don't want to just take down random people on the other side, but if somebody on the other side seems somewhat elite, then they're really eager to find fault with them and some find some way to take them down because that takes down the whole other side by taking out their elites and one by one saying, nope, they shouldn't be seen as elites because of this and because of that, because of the other thing. So, And, and all this competition takes its toll on the common person, right? Well, most people are trying to be elites themselves mm -hmm. or to ally <laughs> themselves with elites that would, you know, help them back. So, you know, one of the main ways anybody raises in status is by affiliating with somebody who's high in status. So we're interested in celebrities and interested in, you know, going to prestigious doctors and getting prestigious teachers to teach us and, you know, working at prestigious firms, hmm. living in prestigious neighborhoods. Also, we can gain prestige by association with the others. Um, so most people are pretty occupied <laughs> with the task of raising their own status and trying to seem higher than others. Why do you think uh, these uh, conspiracy theories pop up? Well, I mean, conspiracy theories are only the name we give to the theories we disagree with personally. <laughs> so there's obviously lots of theories of things that many people have for many different reasons. And when you like the theory, you don't call it a conspiracy theory. You only call it a conspiracy theory when you think it's a wrong theory. And then you think those other people are leaning into that theory for wrong reasons. Um, not because there's good evidence that it's true, but because they like the theory for some other reason, for example, say that it takes down elites of the wrong sort, right? And yes, many so-called conspiracy theories are ways to make some kinds of elites look bad. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they tend to be conspiracies that a certain kind of elite conspired to do a bad thing, right? So if NASA conspired to fake the moon landing, why that's, that makes the people who said they land on the moon look worse. Their, their authority is less, their, you know, impressiveness is less. They should be less deferred to or believed because this thing that supposedly gave them all this respect didn't actually happen. And therefore you shouldn't respect them so much for that. Right. Or if you have a conspiracy about who killed Robert F. John F. Kennedy, the president, that's going to be a conspiracy. Say the CIA did it. Well, that means the CIA is less to be respected. You're taking them down by attributing them as the source of this conspiracy, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but there are, look, there are many conspiracies that are true. <laughs> many times in history, people have conspired to do things. That's pretty clear in the historical record. Uh, so it's not that conspiracies never happen. The question is just which conspiracies actually did happen. Hmm. Uh, better question there might be how 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 can we even solve them at all? Like conspiracy theories from building. How can uh, we prevent people from drawing false conclusions? Yes. <laughs> ah, well, um, the world is full of people with powerful minds. So that's one of the most distinguishing features of humanity as we've got these powerful minds uh, and they are capable of doing a lot of reasoning and drawing a lot of conclusions pretty far from our immediate experience. And that's, of course, one of our superpowers, plausibly substantially aided by culture to uh, extend innate human mental capabilities. And this mind, in many cases, does amazingly at figuring out stuff that's true from diverse evidence available. But these minds weren't only built for that purpose. Our minds were also built to get have us get along in the world around us. 
have us um, have friends and associates and pick them out and, and get them to believe we're loyal to them and things like that. So in many cases, our minds draw conclusions that are less well supported by evidence, but have good social support, good reasons why it would make sense to believe them given the social situation we're in. Mm -hmm. So our book, The Elephant in the Moraine, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life, goes into that in some detail, talking about the many ways in which our minds you know, are unaware of what we do and why, because it's, we're better off not knowing what we do and why. And that's just a general fact about humans, is that their minds aren't just built to figure out the truth, they're also built to, you know, so I have an essay somewhere called Beliefs Are Like Clothes. Mm -hmm. So if you think about if you're in really harsh weather, like the Arctic or something, your clothes are mostly functional. <laughs> you wear clothes that will keep you warm and give you, let you breathe and things like that, because it's a really harsh environment. So with a harsh environment, your, your clothes are really pretty much going to have to be functional or spacesuits. If you think about spacesuits, space is a really harsh environment. So a spacesuit is a really functional thing. It's not mostly for, you know, fashion or other sorts of things. It, it's built to be functional. But if you're in a very mild environment, a sunny beach or something, uh, a tropical paradise, then the weather and the environment is pretty suitable, pretty comfortable, and your clothes don't have to do that much work in protecting you from the environment or letting you fit in with the environment. So if you have clothes in a nice environment, you're going to let them serve other functions. Functions like being colorful, being comfortable, being fashionable allying with your, you know, showing your loyalties, clothes in a comfortable, easy environment will be serving other functions, which, and that makes sense, right? Because the harsh environment, managing the environment function isn't that important. So our beliefs are similar in the sense that in a harsh belief environment, in a situation where it's just really important to get it right, I don't know, say actually being in the Arctic, trying not <laughs> to die, your beliefs about your food supply and how far you can walk and things like that will be pretty functional because you deviate too far from functional beliefs, from true beliefs, then you're going to die, right? But in other environments, say your belief about the moon landings, um, your belief about that doesn't have that much direct impact on whether you live or die. The most of the impacts of those beliefs are through the people around you, whether they like you more, respect you more, how they feel about you based on you having those beliefs. And that's true for most of your political beliefs. That is, you know, when you vote in an election, you're very unlikely to decide the outcome. So your vote doesn't actually decide what happens in the world. Your vote decides mostly what other people around you think about you. Hmm. And that's the social environment that matters for your beliefs. And so your beliefs are like clothes there. You're trying to be fashionable and attractive and interesting and uh, independent, catch the eye. Uh, maybe show an allegiance. Those are the kinds of things your beliefs are doing in mild environments like politics or moon landings or something where uh, it you know it doesn't really affect you directly. It affects you more through your social appearance. So people coming up with more uh, conspiracy theories is a sign of good times? Well, certainly just it's a leisure activity, right? I mean, if you were desperate to survive, you wouldn't have much time to think about <laughs> such things. Uh, so clearly, you are indulging in some leisure to even be thinking about such things far for, you know, not close to your immediate experience. So mm -hmm. it's a hobby, a luxury. But these can be manufactured for uh, manipulating populations, right? Well, I mean, everybody is trying to manipulate populations all the time. <laughs> Look, all through human history, pretty much, pretty much everybody is trying to manipulate the world around them to present themselves a favorable impression. And then people who are leaders are often trying to especially manipulate the world around them to make people think they would be a good leader or should be kept as a leader. Uh, basically, almost all social interactions is people trying to manipulate each other. So that's not new or even surprising. The question this might be, well, are there particularly dysfunctional scenarios of manipulation that we could figure out how to avoid? Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact that everybody's going to be trying to manipulate everyone is just the status quo. Uh, aren't there supposed to be specific morals there to stop 
from manipulating in devious ways? Well, um, we each don't want to be manipulated in many ways. So mm -hmm. our desire to manipulate others is matched by their desire not to be manipulated in many ways. And so um, we've evolved ways to be skeptical of others, ways to be suspicious, ways to check them. And one of those is, for example, counter arguments and rebuttals might learn how to generate them or listen to them if other people generate them. And so we have a whole rich ecology of strategies by which we try to persuade and manipulate and strategies by which we try to check those and counter them and um, resist them. So mm. that's our world and it has been forever. Uh, the things that have changed is say new technologies or communication patterns or things like that have allowed new strategies on both sides. And whatever has been the most recent versions of these will be the newest and the least sophisticated, but with time we'll get much better. What, what is the possibility that a secret society might be con controlling the world? Um, secret society controlling the world. Well, there are world elites and they mm -hmm. do get together all the time in public and in secret to coordinate as best they can on their elite world strategies. So if you remember right after COVID, uh, you know, very early in 2020, the usual public health experts had their usual idea of what to do in a crisis like that, which included masks weren't very useful and travel restrictions that weren't very helpful. And then elites all around the world got together and talked a lot in the coming month about what to do about this. And at the end of that, they come up with a different plan, which included masks and travel restrictions. And then the whole world did it that way. Hmm. Um, and the usual public health experts would have previously a month before said something else, changed their mind quickly to agree with the new elite consensus. And that's what the world did mostly. So the world of elites does coordinate on a great many things, not just COVID policy, but um, medical ethics on nuclear regulation, uh, airline regulation, just lots of different topics. Elites around the world are constantly talking to each other, trying to form a consensus among themselves about what to do to deal with world problems, but also to promote themselves. <laughs> These world elites are promoting their own uh, good, uh, but also looking for opportunities to undermine each other if that can benefit a different coalition. Mm -hmm. So when you say secret, though, the question is, well, world elites are coordinating all the time out in public in great visible ways to try to, you know, decide on policies together and what to do. They also talk in private at dinner parties and other sorts of ways. In fact, you know, but I guess is. is that seems like the answer to your question is yes, obviously the elites, there's a, there are, you know, the, there's a powerful people who coordinate to uh, rule the world that this, what they've always done. Yes. There, there is a saying in psychology, like once a lie is repeated a number of times, it becomes the truth. And that partly seems to be the case that happened in COVID. And there seems to be, as you, as you just said, agenda gets pushed in in times of chaos and if covid is to happen again what's a better way for a person to navigate themselves in such a chaos scenario so you're asking how you can <laughs> better be on the defense side of this game rather than the offense side um so there are just many ways you can just practice thinking and learn to think better <laughs> you know there's this is a thing universities often claim they do um then there's ways that you can not tr just try not to have opinions on so many subjects. <laughs> if you think about it, you realize there's a lot of claims you might hear and you don't need an opinion on that subject. You don't mm -hmm. need to believe it or disbelieve it. Ask yourself whether that opinion is useful to you and whether that's the sort of thing you want to specialize in. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't feel obligated to have an opinion on everything. You should ask, what is the, where am I specializing in the world? What are my topics? Or I'm going to think about them and have answers and 
I'll contribute to the world by having my answers on those things. And on other topics, I will listen to other people and I will believe what they say. So, and then we have the possibility of many kinds of institutions that we have and could use more that we could create that would better cut through these sorts of um, issues. So for example, if you're in a company and it has on a project and it has a deadline, one of the questions is, will we make our deadline? And one of the ways people form opinions of that is they regularly have meetings on, are we going to make our deadline? And everybody says, yeah, we're going to make our deadline. And then people believe what everybody says. Like you said, we believe something repeated often enough. So if everybody's repeating, we're going to make the deadline often enough, you think, I guess we're going to make the deadline. And then, you know, consistently projects don't make the deadline nearly as often <laughs> as their team meeting suggests they will. And a simple solution is to have a betting market on whether you'll make the deadline. If you make a betting market where people can trade anonymously, it typically gives you much more accurate estimates of whether you'll make the deadline. And um, they're not that very expensive to set up. So if you have doubts, say, about whether you'll make the deadline, then you could just set up a betting market and look at the odds and use that as a better source of information. And that's the idea of prediction markets that could be applied in a main, great many areas if you, in order to get better information. Uh, but there are many other mechanisms that people have collected that might be ways to distinguish lies from the truth or misleading things from the truth. Um, I think the more, the, the more fundamental obstacle is that people don't care that much. So in fact, people hardly ever do create prediction markets on project deadlines. Mm -hmm. Even those who know it's possible aren't very interested. Um, and that's also true for most of the other ways we could check truths, uh, mostly they aren't applied. So I think it's less about having the abilities than wanting to. And so I'd say the most fundamental way to believe the truth more often is to create incentives in your world to, to do so. <laughs> so mm -hmm. for example, if you're in a world where people make questionable claims and other people challenge them to bets often, well, they don't make as many challengeable claims because they don't want to be challenged to a bet. So if you make your local subculture the sort that's friendly to such challenges, you will get fewer questionable claims being made. Put more skin in the game. Yeah. And okay. in general, the more you have people around you who, if you said something stupid, would be hard to point it out and criticize you, then you will be less inclined to say stupid things. If you don't <laughs> want to say as, or believe as many stupid things, empower people around you to criticize you. Okay. Okay. Now, um, going on to outer space, a type one civilization is when a planet manages to use up all its energy sustainably. How far are we from becoming a type one civilization? Um, in terms of orders of magnitude, many orders mm -hmm. of magnitude away. Mm -hmm. That is, if you think about the sunlight that you know comes on the Earth as the amount of energy that our planet could be using, then we are vastly less than that. But of course, there's even more energy on Earth that we could be using from all the nuclear fuel that sits around. Uh, so we are many, many orders of magnitude away from using all the energy on Earth. I mean, somebody, I could type into Google quickly and find the answer for a number here, but I'm confident it's well over a factor of a thousand. Where are we right now? What number is it in a point seven? is it? In terms of the percentage of the energy on Earth that we're using? Yeah. It's just crazy low. But I, again, if if we paused and, and I went and calculated, I could get, get you the number, but it's not that hard a number to calculate. Just... How far can we imagine? I mean, type two is when we utilize all the energy from our solar system, type three from our galaxy. How far can we imagine that, thinking down that line? Well, there's the whole observable universe, <laughs> but then... Maybe the, the amount of energy currently being generated in the observable universe is a tiny fraction of the amount that could be generated if you reorganized it better. <laughs> so, I mean, the clear answer is we are vastly, vastly far away from the maximum here. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question is, will we get to the maximum or will we stall or fail somewhere along the path and just stop moving toward that? Mm -hmm. What's your opinion about Elon on this pace of space exploration and opening new perspectives. Um, Elon Musk is clearly one of the heroes of our age, if mm -hmm. not the hero of our age. Uh, 
primarily, I would say, for his space venture, but also for other things, um, in the sense that the space industry was pretty, you know, inefficient and not improving very quickly. And he made huge changes there. He's, you know, made enormous changes to the efficiency of the space industry and, and the prospects for a lot more happening in space. And he's getting substantial value out of that with his satellite services. Uh, and I guess that seems like looking like it'll be a successful business. Mm -hmm. um, I was recently asking the question, what sort of a civilization scale project, what sort of a monumental project could get the most people behind it? I, I was thinking about this from the point of view of how to fix cultural drift, but it's independently an interesting question. If we wanted as a nation or a larger group to commit to some project such that we'd be willing to sacrifice substantially for this project and commit to some mechanism that would do what it takes to make this project happen, even if we have to sacrifice for it, what sort of a project might inspire that level of devotion and willingness to sacrifice among a large group of people? And so I did a set of polls where I asked about 32 <laughs> different possible projects mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, which sort of definition of success would people be willing to get behind as a, as a project in order to um, unite civilization and to have a long-term goal. And then that would also solve some other civilization problems we have. Um, and the top item on the list was the number of people who live in space compared to earth. I, now in my first version, whether this like the number who live on Mars, but I thought, why be, why be so particular about Mars versus space? And so that was the top item out of 32 in terms of motivating. And the number three and four were also space oriented. So I got to say, Elon Musk is right in the sense that the, this idea of going out and getting more people living in space is an inspiring goal that has and can inspire a lot more devotion and coordination to achieve it. And he is, in fact, inspiring his employees and investors to pursue the project of space with that sort of a goal in mind. Mm -hmm. And he is one of those successful uh, in innovators in our era. So, and that is the goal he set himself as the most inspiring goal to uh, coordinate his people with. Mm -hmm. So all told, I got to give him full credit. A hero who took apparently what is, in fact, the most inspiring venture that people could get behind today mm -hmm. and, in fact, got a lot of people behind it and is, in fact, achieving it uh, and at producing enormous innovation and side effect benefits. So, yeah, I guess I'm a big fan. It's it's interesting that your polls got everything. The top answers your polls got were for space explorations because looping back that's a cosmic perspective, right? Because it kind of maybe points out to the importance we all have in our mind of becoming that type one species that we just talked about. Yeah, I think a lot of people think of that as sort of passe or sort of simple-minded and, you know, today we're more sophisticated and we want some sort of more spiritual or ethereal or intellectual or abstract sort of uh, achievements but apparently <laughs> this sort of very concrete physical achievement is at least according to my polls the most inspiring hmm. well, what do you think about uh, neural link and how will that that impact the world when we sort of have a wi-fi fitted out into our heads um so the world is divided into tasks so and then tasks are clumped into jobs. And then workplaces are less clusters of jobs. So a big important choice we have in the world is which task to put near which other tasks. Okay. So a lot, we have a lot of tasks need to be done. And when two tasks, you know, can benefit from a lot of coordination, we put them near each other. And one way to put two tasks near each other is just put them in the same head have the same person do both of those tasks. And then that person can coordinate those two tasks pretty closely. 
and a next way is to put them like in the same work group <laughs> where they meet each other regularly and to, to talk and coordinate those things. And a major choice that our economy makes is how to cluster tasks, right? And, you know, I did a study of automation and a major determinant, probably the major determinant of which jobs get automated is other jobs being automated nearby. <laughs> that is when a, when a task is being done near a bunch of jobs that have been automated, it's just much easier to automate that task as well. So automation is a way in which it basically spreads through the network of tasks. So which tasks are near which tasks you see matters a lot for how we structure jobs, how we do automation, et cetera. All to get back to Neuralink is a way to move some tasks closer to each other. <laughs> that okay. is a task that's being done in a human head and a task being done on a computer. If you have a neural link, a link between the computer and the brain that's more direct than just, say, the eyes and fingers or ears, that link has the potential to move those tasks closer to each other mm -hmm. and sort of reorganize which tasks are close to which. That's the main potential of it, which isn't nothing, but it's also not that big in my mind. <laughs> that is, you know, we still have the question who does which tasks? So mm -hmm. neural link only move some tasks closer to each other. So it might make a human mind better able to do some tasks that need to be done right next to a computer task. So it lets you basically interleave various tasks more finely in terms of computers and humans. So at the moment, you have a task being done by a computer, then it's easy to have another task being done by a computer, coordinate with those things by having them being done on the same computer mm -hmm. or closely connected. Or if you have a task in someone's head, it's possible to have another task being done in someone's head. And when humans and computers are more distant from one another, then there'll be these clumps of tasks that are all being done in a person's head and a clump of tasks that are all being done on the computer. But when the computer and the human mind can get closer, then you can interleave those more. You can have mm -hmm. a bundle of tasks, which are being, you know, some of which are being done by humans and others, which are being done by the computers that are closer together. And that's something, but it's, it doesn't solve this, like the problem of machines taking over all the jobs or things like that. Uh, it doesn't solve the problem necessarily of machines being out of control, but it changes the options, right? It gives you more options for having more things closer to each other, just like the internet or even, um, you know, what we're doing right now on, uh, you know, video conferencing, this allows people in different parts of the world to work more close to each other, right? So mm -hmm. video conferencing makes it more possible for people who live far away to coordinate more closely on job tasks, right? And that's a way in which it helps the economy. Other than man-machine connections, do you feel that this technology will lead to mind-to-mind -to -mind -to -mind connection? Like two minds becoming one? Not really. <laughs> um, I mean, look, humans are already designed in great detail to communicate with each other. <laughs> That's like an overwhelming consideration in, my, in human mind design is how to make the minds able to communicate with each other through our words, through our, um, you know, facial expressions, movements, fingers, etc. We, we, we communicate with each other, we listen to each other. Now, you know, if our minds had had higher bandwidth connections when they were designed, they would have taken advantage of those. So these connections are pretty low bandwidth compared to what can happen inside our heads. But now that our minds are designed this way, it's actually going to be pretty hard to make use of high bandwidth connections directly between them because they really weren't designed for those. So, our, you know, we have ways, you know, our eyes take in information. We've got this whole section of our brain designed around this information comes from our eyes and processing. And it's all oriented around the expectation that this is where the information is coming from. And the same mm -hmm. for our ears. We have a whole systems next to our ears and designing designed to take the information from our ears and rearrange them and to send them on to other places. But that's all designed around expecting stuff to be coming from the ears. Our brains don't really have generic inputs ready to take, you know, electronic signals from other random parts of the universe, you know, if they should be happening to show up on some ship. That's going to be pretty hard to get our minds to, to look at it much. So uh, the possibility of this technology leading to a one consciousness scenario is... Very less or next to impossible? Uh, we actually have one consciousness possibilities to a great degree already. 
um, that, you know, certainly religion and the sacred have long been a mechanisms by which groups of people create a unified consciousness of things that that's kind of their point. And we have enormous capacities for that. So humans have long shared consciousness of many things through those sorts of practices. Mm -hmm. uh, it, maybe we today do a little less of it than our ancestors did, but the capacities are still there. But that's just only totally on one ideology, right? Because one human is a complex mind having n number of ideas and you just connect on one level when we are connecting based on a religion or or one ideology but by one consciousness means uh, i don't have to talk to you right now i know what's everything that's happening in your head i know your context your uh, your preferences right but when we are communicating only based on one ideology that's binding us together uh, can we call that one consciousness any time you have a number of systems that could be separate but are going to be integrated together part of the integration will be shared standards and shared interfaces that that coordinate them. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you know a, a work group of people who are working working together in some company say that work group in order to work together they will have to accommodate each other they'll have to learn a shared language they'll have to learn to create shared expectations so that they can watch each other and learn, you know, react to each other and coordinate. So um, it's just a matter of uh, sort of what time scale of coordination is or how fine grain or how you do the division of labor. Uh, but I actually think our civilization could coordinate much more if we just had more specialization. Uh, I don't know that we need brain links. I think it's mm -hmm. more about finding better ways to divide up the tasks and have each do in our own special part. So for example, you could imagine like a world of a, a electronic database of declarative statements where different people just specialized in editing the different statements and we had incentives for them to, to be consistent across everything. And we could, as a civilization, coordinate much better on all the things we believed by just sharing and editing this shared representation of what we all believe. That's a possible thing we can do, and there are interesting ways that we might imagine doing that. We're not really doing that now. You know, say an encyclopedia is a thing like that, right? An encyclopedia is there's an entry for a bunch of different topics, and different people specialize in updating the entry for each topic. And if there's ever an inconsistency between the different entries, then there are people who specialize in fixing those. And we could do that sort of thing for far more topics than just appear in encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a thing we could do. And there are ways we could do that. And if we did that, then we would be sharing a consciousness in some sense, in a much more important sense. That is, I could just go look up on most any topic, what the consensus on it was. And if I thought that was somehow wrong, I could go edit it. And now the edit would appear when everybody else looked at it. That's a way the world could share a lot more about what we believe. <laughs> so, but we haven't done that yet, but that's less about neural links and more about how we coordinate our behavior. So maybe we are, so you don't see a future where we connect all our minds together. We are connecting all our minds together right now. This is connecting minds. It's just whether the sticking wires in your brain is, is a useful way to additionally connect them. But I think there's a huge amount of potential in the ways that we're connecting right now that we could do a lot more with. We could do vastly more with this sort of connection. And this is the connection our minds were designed for. Our minds were designed to listen to people and talk back to them. They weren't designed really to take electrodes sticking into them and, and make use of that. So extrapolating this sort of mind connections, do you see a future where we are altruistic? Um, coordination tends to look like altruism. Mm -hmm. Like the cells in your body coordinate to keep your whole body healthy. And mostly that looks like altruism in the sense that they are working to achieve the shared goal of the whole body. Mm -hmm. um, but the mechanism isn't directly altruism exactly. <laughs> the, the mechanism is coordination. That, but basically, whenever we figure out ways to coordinate better, everybody's better off. And right. then it looks like you're doing things for others, but 
really was a way to find better mechanisms to coordinate. Simple altruism just doesn't have much of a future. <laughs> Simple altruism just can't be rewarded very directly through natural selection, mm -hmm. but coordination can, and coordination has been rewarded. That is, you know, biology in innovated lots of new ways to coordinate, and we humans have innovated a lot of powerful ways to coordinate at larger scales that no other animal has. But it isn't altruism that's so much enabling our coordinate coordination. Because why I ask that is because a one consciousness will always be at peace. It might have competition within itself, but that that is just for its benefit. That just for its benefit, right? So when you say peace, I guess it's the absence of some kind of conflict. But the key question is, which kinds of conflict is it, in fact, the absence of? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, psychological you know. and physical distress. That's a good starting point. Eh? Distress isn't really about peace versus not. Distress is about just not having enough or being at risk of dying or something, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but that's not peace so much. That Maybe security is a better word. Uh, so security would be a situation where you don't feel much at risk of dying or of losing things you have. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you want a world of security. So in this mind-to-mind -mind connection happening, uh, a good marker is if our security is increasing year by year, we might be going in the direction more of altruism. No. Um, so, I mean, if you think of altruism as doing things for the benefit of others, then we are very altruistic because we are doing lots of things for the benefit of others, but we're not doing them ma mainly directly for that reason. We're doing them for selfish reasons, but because we're coordinating, that induces us to do things for others because our coordination mechanisms reward us for doing so. Mm -hmm. So if by altruism you mean doing things for others when you get no other benefit and you're just doing it for others, that just doesn't have much of a future. That just, it can't have much of a future. That's just the nature of the universe. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't be doing things for others if we figure out better ways to coordinate. But so much of our culture is based on the idea of love. And love is not altruism. <laughs> <laughs> Enlighten me on that. Love is a bond, a, a connection a relationship mm -hmm. and the relationship affects dramatically both parties all the parties involved and it has expectations about what people in this relationship will do it creates you know motivations and patterns of action in terms of how people treat each other feelings of, of certainly in humans of their stance and status in the situation and their desires Love is a package of these sorts of things, and it's a standard package that's been around for a long time, right? This isn't a new package, uh, but as the world changes, we find new ways to embed this in the world and, and places we, uh, we use it and places we don't, but it's not altruism. <laughs> By definition, it, it's meant to be selfless, right? Um, no. I don't think so, no. <laughs> I, I think maybe... A degree of selfness is is part of the self concept of people in that mode, mm -hmm. and a part of their stance toward each other. But, um, I mean, it's not but selfless. Maybe practically, it's not selfless, <laughs> right? So, um, but still, I mean, obviously, like in a strong relationship, people will often be looking at the benefit of the other party and doing things that would help the other party. And not very much expecting an immediate quid pro quo in response, but they are tracking the relationship overall to see if the relationship overall is valuable and supportive. And if they find over time that they are just, the other party is just taking a lot and not giving much, mm -hmm. they will feel that that's not a loving relationship <laughs> and that maybe they don't want to be in it. Hmm. So people will, over time, track the overall consequence of the relationship for themselves. And people are not 
fully committed to staying in the relationship no matter what. They will stay in the relationship if they feel it is being a continued loving relationship. In order for you to be that, they need to feel that the other person is also <laughs> taking their interests into account and doing things for them. If they don't believe that, they will the relationship will then, first of all, might become to seem one-sided, which is a very different kind of love relationship, right? A unrequited love, for example. And unrequited love, as we know, doesn't last as long, right? We, we have this habit of, once we frame love as unrequited and maybe persistently and, you know, indefinitely unrequited, we usually back off on it, Right. We find other loves that will occupy us more and engage our attention more than unrequited loves, right? We, unrequited love is not that popular. Seems like a selfless future for humans is way, way far down the line. Or maybe will never happen. <laughs> Or maybe never should happen. I was reading about this news about the future of Humanity Institute shutting down. What happened there? I don't know. <laughs> I was an affiliate, but I have no inside information other than... The stuff that was publicly reported that some other people in the university, in particularly the philosophy department, didn't like them and were working over many years to try to shut them down and finally succeeded. You were friends with Nick, right? Nick Boston? Yes, right. And uh, yeah. But I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I have, I had one anecdote from many years ago that's mm -hmm. just a weak clue, which is just, I went to visit Oxford uh, as an affiliate with the Institute and... I wanted to meet somebody else at the university because I was interested in their research and I wanted to meet to talk with them about their research because it was related to some of mine. But when I met with them, what I found is the reason they wanted to talk to me is they wanted to lobby me to lobby the Institute to focus more on global warming because <laughs> it's <laughs> branded as the future of humanity, uh, but it's not very focused on global warming. And they thought, well, global warming is really important for the future of humanity and it should focus more on that. And <laughs> I said, well, I thought global warming was pretty well discussed compared to other ne more neglected topics. And the Future of Humanity Institute was doing a good job of looking at more neglected topics about the future of humanity. But mm -hmm. this other person was not too happy with that. Uh, so I expect that's one of the kinds of reasons why other people at the university didn't like them is because they disagreed with their priorities regarding the future of humanity. Well, that was Robin Hansen sharing cosmic perspectives on the Seekers Mind Talks. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation and do check out our other videos as well. Until next time, this is your host Raj signing off.